Okay, I'm Dr. Zalmi Azizan. I am a uh, practicing dermatologist at the uh, main hospital in Kuala Lumpur, Hospital Kuala Lumpur, and also a visiting consultant for two private hospitals, which is um, Thompson Hospital and uh, Damansara KPJ Specialist Hospital. Um, I have been a dermatologist for more than 20 years and currently I hold the post of the president of my society, which is Pesatuan Dermatology Malaysia. I'm also involved with the various uh, scientific committee within the Ministry of Health, uh, especially for dermatological practices and also um, the committee for aesthetic practice as well. Um, I've seen you know, one of my uh, interest my interest in my subject interest in dermatology is mainly wound care and also in laser cutaneous laser practice so I think uh, that's more or less about me in a nutshell first of all I would want my patient to understand the whole disease process itself so a lot of the times I would ask them you know what do you understand about them um, for ex atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis and a lot of the times they tell me it's all about steroid therapy. So it's actually for me, the point of care that I always tell my patient is the importance of emollient or moisturizing their skin so that this would build up their barrier function and therefore makes them less susceptible to all the allergens and therefore would make them less susceptible to getting inflammation. So to me, it's always about the emollients or the moisturizer. Okay, so in terms of the myth or debunking the myth of atopic dermatitis, first of all, is food allergy. A lot of the times they think atopic dermatitis means that they're allergic to um, food. Uh, I would tell them that this is not the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. Food allergy may play a role, but probably 20% of the time it may aggravate the atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis. It is not the cause of atopic dermatitis. I would always say that when you have AD or you know eczema or atopic eczema is mainly you know, you know there is a genetic predisposition and it's not purely food allergy. Food, food allergy may aggravate it and it's not uh, it's not the same for everybody. So probably in children it's more relevant and even then it only plays a role about 20 to 30 percent of the time so that's one of the myths that i would always try to debunk you know eczema does not mean food allergy the other second myth that i'll always try to debunk is steroid a lot of the times they are worried about steroids there's a there's a movement of steroid phobia nowadays so to me i always tell them sometimes the steroid is needed to reduce inflammation but it's not as i say mentioned i mentioned just now to you it's always the moisturizer you need the steroids when you have severe inflammation because if not you get into a perpetual you know like a, what we call this um, loop of itchiness inflammation you know this vicious cycle which is not going to go away so being steroid phobia is good in some ways but then you know as long as there's someone to manage that you know application of steroids so it's good to get an you know, expert opinion about how to use your steroids so not just using your steroids because we have two uh, to me there's two polar one is really scared of steroids one would use very strong steroids until it causes a lot of complications so you want to get a middle route Okay, so that's another myth as I said, steroid is not harmful. It is good if used appropriately, okay? So um, the other myth I would say um, uh, with, um, I think these are the main two myths that I would always try to, you know, counteract with what the patients or the, uh, even the carers perception in terms of managing atopic dermatitis. Um, well, I think there are a lot of things that comes up to these non-pharmacologic interventions you're talking about. Nowadays, there's a lot of things on probiotics and, you know, in terms of even creams, you get creams that has probiotics and obviously probiotics has been around in terms of orally or um, systematically, you know, not just uh, creams are just recently. Um, I, I mean, I to have to tell you the truth, I'm not really a true follower of alternative medicine and I do, um, we had a, a topic 
eczema guidelines um, uh, workshop and one of the um, uh, things that we were looking at is this probiotics in a topic eczema. Uh, there are some papers to support its use, you know, but unfortunately a lot of the papers, you know, has, you know, it's heterogeneous. That means, you know, they don't have the same probiotics. You know, some use different strains, some use different strains, and certain strains are supposed to be much better than different strains. So at the moment, I can't fully recommend the use of probiotics. So sometimes I tell my patient, if it's not harmful, see what how it goes. Because sometimes, you know, you never know if it's harmful. And um, sometimes there's a lot of problems with um, the way it's manufactured because a lot of these things are not manufactured in a good medical uh, practice manufacturer and therefore you get a lot of contaminants and I've seen a lot of things that's been in a sort of not really wanting to be added but they've made it in a factory which may be questionable so we've when I send across there are certain amounts of lead certain amounts of of mercury and even certain amounts of arsenic in those things because of you know not good manufacture practice has been carried out to you know uh, provide the supplements or probiotics that's given so i i mean in terms of non-pharmacological that would probably you know be what my take about it unfortunately because i i always go by scientific evidence and if there's not much of scientific evidence i would not recommend well, to me, phototherapy is good in hardening the skin because, as you know, atopic dermatitis is an itchy condition. People just scratch away until they bleed, you know. So we need to, you know, sort of counteract this itchy problem. And there are a lot of even biologics now to look at even stopping the itch mechanism. You see, therefore, when you stop the itch, they would not scratch. Therefore, inflammation is less. So, phototherapy works in that way. You know, it hardens the skin so that itchiness will be less. However, you still need again, it's back to the moisturizing. You still need to build up your barrier function. You still need to moisturize, 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 especially after phototherapy or during phototherapy treatment because the skin gets very dry and you need, if not, the patient will be itching away after phototherapy. Um, well, um, for, first of all, so phototherapy to me is, uh, in a way, is systemic. You know, it acts, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, the cells into your skin, you know, so it's not just hard in the skin. And sometimes that could also affect your exposure to ultraviolet radiation and some people may do worry about getting um, uh, non-melanoma skin cancer but as long as I say it's managed properly there is somebody who looks at what dosing uh, been given to these patients and there's a certain amount of uh, doses that you can't go beyond so that should not be a problem but in terms of the other weakening therapy that you know when you talk about steroid therapy uh, systemic steroids I am not an advocate of uh, anything systemic steroids I only use steroids in so I don't like it's not my first line of treatment in terms of systemic steroids because definitely that would weaken your immune system in some ways and um, it's cause a bad rebound if you use systemic steroids. When you talk about the other systemic therapy that may weaken your immune systems like methotrexate, uh, azathioprine or even cytosporin, as I said, they do weaken as long as if we need to give this, these patients are monitored, not just be given, you know, like um, giving Smarties or you know m and you know so it has to be monitored and for me before i start on this treatment i always do a baseline uh, full blood count liver function test renal profile to make sure their bone marrow are okay and then one week to the treatment i'll recheck it again to see how the response to this treatment so it does weaken your immune system but you need to make sure that these are all being monitored so that's why now you are going on to more of a biologic treatment you know where you don't really it's all targeted you don't go and really you know affect the bone marrow but as i said these also are not without its problems so you have to not just give it like that without monitoring at the end of the day you need to give all this you know and if you need to give you need to give it but you have to monitor your complications uh, to me, um, 
as I mentioned to you, food allergy, or sometimes most of the times, the allergy, the allergen that's involved in pediatric cases are not so much as food allergy, is the arrow allergen. You know, looking at house dust mites and things like that. Um, as long as, as I said first, the basic has been done, which means looking at maximizing the skin care of the patient, maximizing the inflammation of the patients, you know, and once all the basic of um, the first line or in fact, in fact, the second line of management of topic eczema has been looked at. And then if the patient's atopic eczema has not been controlled, you may consider immunotherapy. But to me, if they have other uh, problems with this, not just skin, let's say they have allergic rhinitis or even asthma. So that, you know, you kind of like hit, you know, the, you know, uh, immunotherapy all in one go. But even though some patients of mine who has allergic rhinitis and they went for immunotherapy, uh, which is done in a private hospital, but the eczema may not improve. You know, so now I suppose you know I mean looking at all this immunotherapy, and then now we have even biologic therapy for atopic eczema. So I would go for biologic therapy first before I would then go on into immunotherapy. They are equally as expensive. You know, because um, in Hospital Kuala Lumpur, we do not give immunotherapy. You may need to go to a private hospital for this. So this is my take on immunotherapy. Uh, you, If you have other uh, atopic diseases, I think, you know, that it probably gives some benefit, but not just purely atopic eczema because atopic eczema is multifactorial. It's not just about the allergen. Um, well, during the COVID-19 period would probably be, I mean, in COVID-19, obviously it's a viral treatment, a viral um, problem. But in terms of muco or you're talking about uh, fungal diseases, um, we it's not even the COVID. We do have um, fungal infection, as, uh, which is a secondary fungal infection. You know, because a patient has a topic eczema, this is again, as I mentioned, the barrier function is affected. So you are prone to get not just fungal infection, but even stavorous um, um, bacterial infection, or even other viral infection, such as uh, my patient had a severe uh, molluscum contagiosum, you know, and he has underlying atopic eczema. So that, you know, it is p p purely because your barrier function is compromise and therefore you are more prone to get mucomycosis, you are more prone to get viral infection or even bacterial infection. So, you know, and it's not just during the COVID pandemic, people with atopic eczema, unfortunately, this is one of the complications they may get. Okay, for um, any first of all reported adverse drug reaction, you have to make sure this is the drug implicated in this adverse reaction. Because sometimes some people may be on a number of drugs and sometimes it may be difficult to pinpoint that is the drug. So first of all, you have to um, make sure this is the drug implicated. And then we have a uh, formulation at least. Okay, there is a committee that look at adverse drug reaction and we report any adverse drug reaction and we uh, stratify them. Either it's category one, category two. Category one is, you know, it's definite and category two is probable and category three is possible. So even though you're sometimes you're not sure which drug, but it's good to have it reported. And then and there is a committee that looked at the reports every month. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, as I said, if you have an adverse drug reaction, get it um, reported um, because even though it's voluntary, but it's good to do that because that you, um, you for in Malaysia at least, we report it and then all the information goes to a central information which is looked by the WHO, you know, in Oslo, you see, so um, it's just get compiled. So anything that is reported is good because every drug, especially new ones, um, there is post-marketing su surveillance of this drug. So please report adverse drug re reaction, but try to, you know, guess because sometimes, you know, you have to make sure you have your timeline 
you know, really in place to know whether that drug actually gives the adverse drug reaction. So get it reported and then, you know, obviously it's back to ABC if the drug causes severe adverse drug re uh, reactions such as your SJS and your uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis, make sure the patients vitally are stable and then, you know, it's a good nursing care and then you may then uh, think about other uh, drug to um, counteract the reaction of the adverse drug reaction. If it's very severe, as I said, make sure that they are vitally stable. And then, you know, like for SGS or TN, sometimes, you know, we may need to consider things like cyclosporine, you know, but as I said, these are all controversial as long as you get the patients, you know, really stabilized. And if you want to give such treatment, make sure there's no secondary infection. If it's just a minor, like, the macular papular rash, you may give a bit of steroids if it's really bad and then or even just topical steroids if it's not so severe. So this is, as I said, first, you know, make sure what is the drug indicated and then if once you make sure, withhold that drug and then make sure your patient is stable and get it reported. This is um, how I normally um, deal with adverse drug reaction. Yes, I definitely believe um, a psychological intervention is needed in most skin patients, in fact. Okay, not just in itching. Sometimes even in psoriasis, okay, they don't have itching, but they just feel, especially if they have psoriasis over the face, you know, it really impacts them psychologically. They, you know, lose, you know, this, you know, their sense of, you know, confidence and things like that. You see, so uh, it's good for us in our psoriasis patient, as I say, even though it's not itching, but we always assess their, um, we call this dermatology life quality index, the LQI, and we do an assessment for most of our new patients that come to see us. So if you know they are affected psychologically. We refer them to a psychologist which works under the psychiatric department in Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, like my advice, you know, is obviously to um, attend as many, um, you know, webinars now that it's webinars, you can't even have conferences. Attend as many CME sessions as you could because um, for me, I still do that once a week. Like this is probably. Um, once a week would be probably be about three or four sometimes webinars I attend even though you know I know about skin but there's always something new and um, especially for the um, for us we always do all these webinars to teach primary care doctors in terms of diagnosis in terms of looking at the salient features so my advice you know to attend as many CME sessions as you could okay and secondly as I said for me uh, for a topic eczema uh, we actually did a, um, a clinical practice guidelines which has been uploaded in the um, um, Dermatological Society of Malaysia website and also in the Ministry of Health of Malaysia website. So there are a lot of websites, you know, in terms of, uh, but make sure these websites are vetted, okay? <laughs> so not just anybody that can put up the guidelines. So look at these vetted guidelines, you know, so they helped you to um, see you know the conditions and what can you do and what can you not do and when you should refer so even in my guidelines we have a se session on when to refer a topic eczema patients and I also help out with the guidelines for uh, acne vulgaris and we also have one se section that says when to refer this to a specialist so you know, learn as much as you can in CMEs and then you know um, uh, look at the uh, website for guidelines okay and thirdly is um, make sure you know as I said be friendly with the dermatologists and you can always call them you know? so I've got a lot of uh, primary care doctors who just whatsapp me pictures and whatnot and just asking for opinions so this is my advice to primary care doctors well I mean as I said um uh, things are moving okay to me you always have to have a broad mind and you know make sure as i say you go and attend cme so that you learn new things so what you learn today may not be relevant you know probably in even in a year's time yeah like i said the jack inhibitors you know were not even being talked about when i was in training and now it's coming up and um, it's sort of coming up in the pipeline of dermatologists but i mean having to use something new you know you have to um as I say, attend as many conferences so that you know the complications and be careful, you know, not just 
just because you've heard a CME session about it and tomorrow I'm going to order the drug and use it, you see. So to me, it's always, you know, be careful, you know, when you want to try something new and whatever the guidelines that say this is what you have to do, what are the indications, follow the indications, do not do things off-label, you know, especially when it's something new. And as I say, it's good to have an interaction with other specialty, especially uh, the rheumatologists because some somehow or other they are uh, use all these biologics and even um, you know your immunosuppressants and even the checks much earlier than you so I have a few um, rheumatologists very close friends that I also you know talk to them now especially in terms of vaccinations because they you know they also help out with guidelines in terms of side effects of vaccination and what when people on immunosuppressants and even on the jacks and all so to me as I said it's good to you know be open when something is new but do not be a gung-ho person and just use it without knowing about it okay and then I said make friends with other specialities so that you you get this interaction and at the end of the day it's all about helping your patients it's not about helping you it's about helping your patients